this this knot comes in many many forms. So the one I'm showing you is is probably the most basic, and you simply use a four sided blank um, to build it into your blank. Okay. Um, Probably the most important part is the first step is to decide what you're going to make so that you can pick the right size plank. If you're going to make a candlestick like the one that's going around, a uh, small one like that, you want to pick this size of plank and then size everything appropriately. Get the wood going, get the grain in the right direction. Uh, you really want it to be going up and down. Um, I think in the blank that I passed around, the grain is actually going sideways because it was cut off of the end of a, a board of cherry. Not an ideal way to turn this, but it, it worked out okay on that one. Yes, how important is, is it that your blank is absolutely square? It has to be absolutely square. Okay. That's, so that's the important. first and most important thing, is this blank has to be square. So. This one here, it, it looks like it's square, but maybe not really. And what, we're, what we'll do is we'll try to square it up. And really all you do is you take your, your smallest dimension on your wood. You set your, your fence on your, on your band saw. Okay. And then you turn it over to one of the other sides. And you just run it through and square it up like that. You go through all the sides. So it's all nice and square. I'm not going to do that because it's going to make a ton of dust if I do that. And it takes a lot of time. Um, suffice to say, what you want to do is end up, if you're going to make a larger um, hollow form or uh, like for, a, for a tea light or a bigger candle, um, this one's all squared up. It was actually a four by four cedar fence post that I played around with. Um, cedar's nice and easy to turn and it smells good. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll use this to make one for a tea light tonight. Um, this one here is mahogany. Um, I squared it all up, put all the cross pieces in and it's, it's ready to turn. Um, you can pass those around so you can see what what our objective is as we, as we go through this tonight. So, um, once you decide what you're going to make, probably the next step is to lay out on your, on your blank, um, where your, in this case a candlestick, where is that going to, candlestick drill out going to be? Where do you want to put your knot? Just mark two lines and an X. And these two lines tell you how much of a weight you're going to have on your design. If you make it narrow, it won't be very rounded at the top. If you make it big, it will get really rounded at the top and the bottom, okay? And then just mark out where your tenon's going to be so you don't get lost as you're rotating this around and then figuring out how to get it on the lathe the way you intended it. Because normally when you make these, what, after you've made your first one, you will probably want to make several blanks at one time while you're set up and doing it because it takes a while to prepare these blanks. It's going to take you a few days by the time you make a cut and let the dry. So, this one's all nice and square. All right. And the other thing that's really important is you want to make sure your ends are square. So, you need a little sled to fit this band saw so that we could just go and cut the end off of here. And now it's square, these, these, all these sides, likewise on this end. What that does is it lets it get the maximum amount into the chuck and it leaves the top nice and flat for drilling trying to get that set up. Okay. Then, what you want to do, we made our marks here for how big we want to make our Celtic knot, and it's probably about three quarters of an inch, something like that. And so what you need is a sled that will fit in here with a fence that can move. 
And that way you can adjust to match the angle that you've chosen for how big you want to make your Celtic knot. So if you want to make it bigger, you would increase this angle and it will cut a bigger angle, um, a, a longer path across the wood. Okay? <clears throat> On this one, I decided to go with three quarter inch. And so when I line this up with the blade, that turns out to be approximately 25 degrees on here. Why that's important is, is if you're making multiples of these, you may not want to make them all exactly the same. So what I do is I write on the piece of wood what the angle is, and I, and I kind of name it by its length, um, and then a number after that. You want to mark on, on Stuart, your... Do you, I'm sorry. Do you decide the thickness of the band when you're putting it here or when you're doing that function? Um, I'm going to get into that. Okay. Right. Um, you want to put a mark here so that you know where to line this up every time. Because as you rotate, cut the next side, the other three sides, you always want to end up in the same place. That way your peaks line up going all the way around your piece once it's turned. Okay? So you put it on. Now this one I'll cut so you can see. You want to cut very slow so your blade doesn't wobble and make a nice even straight cut. You want to stop just before you go through, somewhere between the 16th and the 32nd of an inch, you want to stop so that you have a little hinge here. That's going to ensure this stays aligned when you put your veneer in here and glue and clamp it to hold it down. Okay? So what I did <laughs> is the thickness of this line is going to be the thickness of your blade. If you want to have a wider piece of wood in there, you'll need to get a wider blade or make multiple passes to widen it. Um, a note of caution, if you're going to do that, make sure you set stops on your mechanical stops and spacers to accommodate that because you want them to be repetitive because you want these these lines on there to kind of be the same width. And you can do smaller ones on a table saw too, right? Yeah, and that's what I did. The one that's on here, I made, those are eight inch. Okay. These ones are about one thirty seven. Okay. And all I did is I took, I decided, well, this is a nice piece of African mahogany. I'm going to make some white oak um, veneer to go in there. You could use a darker wood if you wanted, like Yumli mahogany, which is much darker. You could use walnut, whatever, whatever you want. Purple heart. Purple heart. Um, some of that red stuff. What do right. we call that? Padouk. Padouk, I was Good. thinking of, yeah. Or, um, yeah, any of those. Pink yeah. ivory. Yeah, ivory. Yeah. All the expensive All the expensive stuff. The expensive stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so. You've got your cut made. Now what you're going to do is insert your veneer in here. Uh, do you blow out that crack with the compressor just to make sure it's clean on that? You can. Um, it usually is because, I mean, I've never had a lot of stuff stained. But it's probably a good idea. Is it pretty critical to have it fit? You want this to fit perfect. Yeah, so if you have to go sand it a little bit, because this is a little tight, go search for one that fits a little bit better. Okay? These are a little, a little tight, so they need to be probably sanded down. <clears throat> that worked in there. 
you have to pop this open a little bit to make sure it fits. Um, and then you want to cut this off just a little bit longer so that you can tap it in and uh, get it to go all the way down. So what you do is you take and you put your glue on there. And take your ruler. And this is real important. Pipe on any of these glues. If you don't put the glue on the wood, don't count on it getting there by itself. It won't, it's not just going to migrate there. You've got to put it there. Being that you're going to be turning this and cutting it and turning it and cutting it and then putting it on the lathe and spinning it, you want to make sure that this is glued together properly. It's not a sketchy glue job. No, don't be cheap with the glue. So that's on there pretty good. Now, you want to glue both sides of your near and you can use um, a commercially made veneer you might have to stack two of them up I had some of that here but I just put this place to I'm going to get this all the way down as far as you can because that's how far you're going to have to turn it down to see that the line where, where it peaks up. Okay. So what you do is you pick the fingers off. <laughs> Take a clamp and put it on here. You want to make sure you get your clamp lined up straight. So it's concentric with the center of the block wood. Tighten it up. Glue should squeeze out everywhere. If it doesn't, it means you probably didn't get enough glue in there. This end grain, when you put glue on it, it soaks up a lot of it. And it may soak up so much with some woods that when you go clamp it, nothing squeezes up. If that happens, undo the clamp, open it back up, and put some more glue in there. It's better than having it fly apart on you when it's on the lid. Okay. So, um, this is Type Bond 3 that we're using. It sets up in about 20 minutes. It's dry to probably 50% strength in, in a couple of hours. I like to leave it for at least eight, even overnight. Um, sometimes when I do these glue ups, I'll do one like this in the morning, and then later in the afternoon, I'll cut, it, cut another slot in here and do the next one, okay? Um, but that's all you do. So the next 
one, so this time when we did it, we cut it in that position. So the next one you do, you're going to trim all this off of here, you're going to rotate it 90 degrees, line it up, have this set at the 25 degrees, and make your next cut a certain next veneer. When that's glued and clamped and dried, rotate it again and rotate it again four times. And what you'll end up with is an X on all four sides with a line around top and bottom. Mm -hmm. and that's how you know you're done. The one in your hand is that doesn't have the bottom line yet? Yeah, it does. It's just it, it, because there's that was where the hinge was, you have to imagine. Okay. It's there. It's there. Because you can see the wood goes all the way through, so you know there's there's going to be a line there. Okay, likewise here, there's a veneer that goes all the way through, so you know. Right? All there. Okay. Um, Making these slits, I left some instructions on, in, in the handout that I've got for tonight. I'll email to everyone. Tells you how to make these slits. Um, pretty easy. If you invest probably a half a day, you can make a set of these for your bandsaw. And it makes it really easy to do this kind of stuff. If anybody wants, um, I've got enough stuff here to make um, four sets of these. So come and see me if you want, and I'll give you all the stuff that you need. Okay. So there'll be a base, there'll be two bases, there'll be a runner into two common sizes, which are 5 eighths and 3 quarter inch yeah. um, of the miter slot and the table saw, or the band saw, and um, a fence. Um, and for the, for the miter, um, I even give you a T-nut and a bolt for one, so you can put it together in a piece of wood that you can make a knob of. And as a turner, you guys can make that knob. All you do is you drill some holes. to make um, to make the little knob is find the center you put your compass on here and draw a circle that's going to be the outer diameter of your knob when you put it on the blade and turn it um, then that that radius take and put your compass out where one of these two lines crosses and put an arc there and an arc here and then go to the opposite one, put an arc there and an arc there. And now you've got a perfect hexagon. Okay? Because the radius goes into the circumference six times. Alright. Um, what you do then is drill a small hole right at the edge of that, right on that line, all the way around. Um, and I use, I don't know if I use a quarter or something less than that. But whatever size you want the ridges on the knob to be. And then what you do is you drill a hole in the center that's 9, 30 seconds of an inch. It tells you this in the instructions. And then you put it on the lathe and you turn it. And it takes away all the wood and it leaves you with a roughed out knob like this. And then all you have to do is you may have to do a counter bore to make the head of the screw fit in far enough so that it sticks out into the teeth. And it's Piece of cake. Um, where are we? Okay, so let's say this is magically all done and it's already on the lathe and it's ready to go and the wood grew. <laughs> um, this is one that I prepared using a table saw, so the lines in here are eighth inch instead of 132nd, okay? Um, Western Red Cedar and American Walnut. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a tea light uh, candlestick here. 
and the tea light will go at the top and we're going to put a tenant on the bottom here was what my plan was. Um, I'm big into planning, as you can tell. So what we'll do is turn this on and get the tenant going. At this point, you could rough this out a little bit. Um, or you can wait until it's in the chuck. different grain. It's a lot harder than the cedar. So the tool really moves a lot. You cut through it. Plus you're hitting side grain and in grain at the same time. Exactly. Do you use any materials other than wood to do this? I haven't, but like I suppose you could. Aluminum or copper or you call them ball. I haven't, but I, 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 I plan on trying. Because aluminum and brass and copper can all be turned with these tools easily. They also have like, those materials you use on knife blades. Yeah. Different colors, black, red, white. Um, yeah. Every 30 seconds, I guess. Keep wanting the control panel to be here because that's where it is. On my <laughs> um, so you can see the the things are starting to take shape, right? Yeah. Kind of cool. Yeah, it's always <clears throat> kind of neat. Uh, it's not completely round, but that's okay. Uh, what I want to do is get it in the chuck, and we'll get the hole drilled for the T light, and then we'll give this some shape and cut it off. Okay.
you have, How are we doing uh, on time? Oh, you're using a tea light. I was thinking of a regular candle. Like you could you could make it bigger for a regular candle, or you can make it smaller for one of these these uh, taper taper candles. Yeah, uh, Gerhard up in Palm Beach used to make them, and he had these little uh, brass inserts for that tall yes. skinny candle. Yes. Yes. They make them for those. They make them different sizes for different size of candles, and they do dress it up nice. And I think they also. Um, add a level of safety so the wood doesn't catch on fire right. if the candle burns down. Okay. I think that's, that's one thing to be careful about that's with good. these wooden candlesticks is you can't leave them unattended. <coughs> uh, they will catch your house on fire. Um, <coughs> you can do it at home, but be careful. Where is that lathe kept? Here? Uh, in the storage room. So, yeah. It's a little nicer than the ones we have. <laughs> the jet lay is actually nicer than our one. I agree. A little heavier. It yeah. ain't a craftsman. <laughs> I had <to> true. <coughs> I started on one of those. That's what I started. It was I, from that's like, what I got. I swear it was from the 1940s, right? I will get a jet though, I'll guarantee that. I was doing wood turners without borders in Puerto Rico about eight years ago. They sent us 12 of those for the class, the three day class, and yes. two of them broke before we even turned them on. Wow. The tail socks broke. But so this is a newer one, so the bugs work better. I like to do the drilling before I finish the outside. That way you know where the hole is. And if you're going to make a little kind of copper indentation to catch wax that drips down the candle, you do that. And then work on your shape, whatever it is that you want it to be. Um, So um, tea light candles, which is what I was going to try and fit into this one, are um, they're one and a half inches typically. That's these these little guys, and they make bigger ones. They're a little bit taller. Those ones are like one and three quarter inch diameter. But if you're if you're making them for a candle, know what you're intending it for and put them in it so people, if you're giving them away, know, know what what to buy. Yeah, have the candle while you make it. My buddy heard yeah. made a whole bunch of them and he bought different candles and they wouldn't fit in there. Right. And the hair <laughs> yeah. Too big is okay. It's a too small. No, oh, the candle wouldn't go in the hole. The hole is too small. Oh. What's a typical candle? It's like five eighths? Seven eighths. Seven eighths? Yeah. yeah. These tapers are seven eighths. And there's some some of the there's some really tall ones you can buy that are like one inch in diameter, the handmade ones. Forstner bits. When you use these things, you um, you need to pay attention to how fast you're 
drill is spinning or your work is spinning. It's real important that you don't drill too fast because they all they do is generate a lot of heat and it dulls the, the, um, the cutting edge and it burns the wood. Um, and the other thing you want to do is you want to keep these bits lubricated. Um, I use just regular furniture wax that you put on the wood, um, either the Minwax stuff or Verithane or S.C. Johnson, Bry Wax, and any of those paste wax that you sell for wood work really good for lubricating these because they can go on here, they can go in the wood, they don't affect the finish if you're finishing later. What they will do is if you're trying to glue anything, they will prevent glue from sticking, which in some <coughs> cases might be a good thing. Um, but anyway, I always make sure these are kept lubricated and um, you always keep them sharp. Um, super easy to sharpen. <coughs> super easy. Once you, I mean, you don't let them get too dull. You never let them get dull, otherwise you'll be here for a month of Sunday to try to get it sharp. But just get something to hold it. I'm just using a little plant. I've got a, this is a diamond. Um, Slipstone, and this is the CBN that I got from Ken Rizza. It's, um, it's 600 on one side, 1,000 on the other, and I think this this stone is probably somewhere around you know 3,000 something like that diamond. Um, I prefer to use this one because I I don't want to wear out my my Forstner bits, and I sharpen them really regularly, but. Um, what you do is just, just a little bit of water on there, on your stone. And normally these are hollow ground. So you take and you put your little stone on here, and you slide it back and forth and balance it on those two edges. A couple strokes, it shines it up a little bit, you rotate a bit. The other side. Boom, you got a nice sharp, sharp bit, you're ready to go. Nice, easy, steady motion, so you're not too big a hurry. Nope. And just, this is the, what you want to just pass them around. But you can see where I've sharpened these in, in the past. You don't want them to be any dull, any more dull than this. Um, you don't, all of these I would show. You don't do anything with the teeth around the edge? You can go and um, use a file or you can use your stone and you can you can sharpen the teeth while it's there. Um, or some, some of the bits will have a, a round here. You can use one of those little diamond files like you would use for a chainsaw and put it in there and sharpen it up. That'll work. Okay. But sharp, lubricated, and keep the speed down. Horsner bits, you don't really want to be turning them at anything over 500 RPM for these small ones. When you get above one inch, you really don't need to go over about 350. Um, and when you get up to like two, two and a half, and three inch ones, you want to be down around 200 or even as low as 150 RPM. Okay. The other thing is you want to you want to feed pretty aggressively, and you want to back them out so they don't overheat and relubricate. What do you do if you're stuck with your slow speed is 650? Find another way to do it because you're just gonna you're just gonna ruin your bit. I mean, if you like sharpening, yeah. What I've been doing is starting using like three different sizes, drilling a small hole and then a bigger one. Well, I mean, I think you should always do that anyway. If you're going bigger than, than an inch and a half, um, I, I would do multiple holes, but I would always. I would always mark and cascade the three sizes you're going to use <clears throat> so that you have a way to make sure that as you go out bigger that it stays concentric with the original hole you were drilling. I yeah. usually start with the big line and big go line. in just enough to make a mark. Exactly. And then yes. I'll do a smaller one, 
do the same mark, then go down to the middle, lowest one, drill the hole, and yep. go back up to the larger ones in, in order. That way you're not yeah, trying to crank them out. If you don't do that mark where that outer little tooth can ride in, it, your bit will be jumping over <coughs> on the, the center yeah. point hole. That's a great idea, thanks. Well, and you can actually, if, if your green on your wood grabs it, it could knock it out of your truck. Here's in soft cedar, so never. Not likely, but <laughs> I can blow that up. <laughs> Okay, I've got this down on the low speed range. little lathe could go pretty slow. Uh -huh. That's good. So anyway, there's no readout on here. I don't know how fast this is going. That looks like it could be I don't know. 492. There we go. Yeah. Just what I was going to say. So it doesn't have a lot of power. Yeah, <laughs> that, that could be. <laughs> no, I see the problem. Yeah, pick up speed. Back it up. Find your toothbrush. Not the one you used this morning. Actually, or maybe the one you used this morning. The one you're going to use tonight. Exactly where your wife finds out it's missing. Or you use your wife's feet. Yeah, it would be the guy, wouldn't it? Yeah. So what's nice is this isn't even hot yet. So that's cool. Not even melting wax hardly. Yeah, so we can go back. Now if you're <clears throat> if you're drilling wood that's really hard like maple or even this uh, mahogany we have locally or rosewood, take wax and put it in the hole. Um, and especially on the bottom and the walls, it just helps keep the bit lubricated and, and not getting hot. So that's probably about as deep as we want to go for the key light. There. Should fit in there okay. Yeah, there we go. Beautiful. So that part is done. So now what we can do is work on the rest of it. Exactly the right distance you'll notice. Calibrate it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lucky. <laughs> Fortune. <laughs> okay. So do they have a lip on them, those tins? Huh? Do they have a lip on them or are they straight straight edges? These ones are straight. straight. Usually they're straight. Yeah. Um, so now what you want to do is make your little get the bit out of the way actually so you don't hurt yourself. Over here. Yeah. You got a few elbows. So I don't bleed. 
I don't feel like turning this back up to the high speed right now. Um, just make a little uh, little indentation for the wax to collect. Okay. It also prevents the tea light, if it does get hot, from lighting the wood on fire. It's important. Okay. So there, just a little counterboard there. That's it. That's all you gotta do. And now, just try to shape the rest, whatever way you want it, and part it off. At this point, would you normally use a tail saw? A what? Yeah, stop. Over I suppose you could if you wanted to, yeah. this off probably avoid this knot that's here because I don't, I don't want that in there so I just cut it off at this point and there's your little candle holder maybe give this a little bit more shape up here probably I turned a lot of this western red cedar. It's really nice to turn. You need to have, you need to keep your tools super sharp. They do stay sharp a long time, um, and you have to turn at a really high speed. Stuart, shouldn't you be more of a masculine Yeah. I said that earlier. Yeah, that's what I said. I, I normally would be, but you would, you wouldn't be able to hear me. <laughs> western red cedar. Some people have reactions to it. Yep. Well, it is. It is. Toxic. You don't want to eat it. Yeah. You don't want it to be in contact with food. They're saying, they're saying now that red cedar, cedar dust is as bad as this. Yeah. So, eastern aromatic cedar, absolutely true for sure. Yeah. What about Florida cedar? <laughs> it does the same stuff, right? But anyway, there. That's it. Cool. That's all there is to it. Part it off. <laughs> We made a mess. I
Any questions real quick that haven't been asked? For you or for you? For him. Oh, okay. Okay, so uh, what's my the blue time on the, uh, or the time for each one separate? You do an eight of them, so it takes about six to eight days? Yeah. Yeah. Normally, yeah, I, I would say I, when I, whenever I build these, I, I'll spend a week building these up, um, and I'll do like a dozen or two dozen of them, and then spend a week or a few days turning. Can you actually do it if you cut all the way through? You can do it. The problem that I have is the clamp, it, it gets misaligned. Yeah. Now, you can take another clamp and put it the other way if you want, but it just gets kind of cumbersome. My buddy Herbie had uh, he did a lot of pepper mills where the woods glued together on a bias. And yes. Yeah. He built a box. It was just a flat piece of plywood. Had a board here and here, and we put some plexi on there. Yeah. And he would clamp it that way and this way. Okay. And that would keep it pretty good. Okay. And once in a while, he would have some slippage on it. Yeah, I watched some some guys at a turning club in, whether it was in Virginia or Tennessee, um, that had a video on YouTube about this method. Because I, I, I wanted to do it. Uh, my father used to do it, but he died before I learned from him. Oh, okay. So uh, I, I watched YouTube until I found something that made sense. But these guys were, were pretty, pretty good. Anyway, it works. Then you do, would you recommend doing those cross glue ups first before you do the two parallel ones? Well, actually, they they all go in from the side, and so when you're when you're making a straight line on one side, in theory, you're making a straight line on the opposite side. It just doesn't come through because you left a hinge there, right? Yeah. So then, when you rotate it 90 degrees, now it, it it looks like you've got part of an X. When you cut this way, you'll make you'll cut right through that other one. But you, but you started your first two cuts as your diagonal first. Well, they're all diagonals. They're all yeah. cut on the diagonal. The first one was a straight. Nope. No. Twenty-five degree angle. They're they're all they're all cut. They're all cut on this angle because. This one you cut boom this way. Now you're going to rotate this block yeah. 90 degrees, oh, and it's going to cut. And then you rotate it and yeah. it cut. It's cut on that angle there. As yeah. You run to through. This is going straight. Every one of you is cutting. Yeah. Every one of yeah. you is that angle. Yep. And you can. I mean, I, I want to try doing it with a hexagon because I think in in bigger ones it would be nice that there were more points. And if you made it, if I made it wider, because these are these are kind of flat, as you can see, especially when you get in closer to the center, they get smaller and smaller. Um, I would like to see them have bigger points, like a sun ray. But it's lots of playing around. Thank you very much.